The original Xbox is a interesting console. Launched by Microsoft in the US on November the 15th of 2001 and later brought to Japan in February and Europe in March of the following year, the Xbox was Microsoft's first venture into the gaming console market. In many ways the system was both a success and failure at the same time. It would break sales records in North America and worldwide it would sell a total of 24 million units. However, outside of the West it would struggle, most notably only shifting a total of 450,000 units in Japan. Its lifespan would technically stretch from 2001 to 2009 in terms of support and repair services, but the release of the Xbox 360 in 2005 saw both Microsoft and gamers move on quickly to the next generation. Despite its slightly short lifespan, the Xbox would still make quite the impact on the industry. Approximately 1,000 games would release on the system, with some of its biggest hits becoming some of the best-selling games of the series generation, even though its player base was dwarfed by that of the PS2. The system would quickly become a competitor in the market as it featured a decent list of hits that were exclusive to, or at least first available on Xbox. Games such as Fable, Project Gotham Racing, Chronicles of Riddick, Mech Assault, Otogi, Knights of the Old Republic, Ninja Gaiden, Jade Empire, Forza Motorsport, Splinter Cell, and of course Halo, would help Microsoft become one of the big players in the console gaming arena. What also helped was the introduction of Xbox Live in 2002, and although this wasn't the first console-based online gaming service, it was certainly the first to get it right, and even with the annual subscription charge, Xbox Live managed to pull in over 2 million subscribers before the end of the generation. The original Xbox is a special console to me personally, I was lucky enough to get my hands on it fairly early, and even though I didn't know what to expect, the combination of its technical prowess and groundbreaking online service resulted in some truly mind-blowing experiences for me as a kid. It is a system that launched some of my favourite gaming franchises of all time and broke a long list of records, but at the same time, to a lot of people out there, the first Xbox is just that of a console that tried to compete with the GameCube and PS2. As I mentioned earlier, I feel like it was both a success and a failure, which is why I find it so interesting and because I'm so interested by it, I decided to go back to the very start and take a look at what games Microsoft brought to the launch party. Now, in comparison to other consoles of this time, the launch titles for the Xbox were a lot less consistent from one region to the next, with some games never making it outside of the US or Japan, even after the launch period. I will be focusing on the North American and European launch, but just to cover all bases, let me quickly mention the games that I was unable to get a hold of due to region exclusivity. Exclusive to the US was Madden 2002, NFL Fever, NASCAR Heat 2002, NASCAR Thunder 2002, Test Drive Off-Road Wide Open, and a remake of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. Sadly, without modding or emulation, these games aren't available to me, but what is available to me is the other 25 games across a variety of genres, so for this video I've taken all of them for a spin to provide my general impressions on each of them and to get a better look at the start of this wonderful console. So, without further ado, let's begin. We begin with the racing games, and the first racer that I got stuck into for this video was Mad Dash Racing. The concept is fairly simple, everything takes place in a Saturday morning cartoon star world in which a bunch of talking animals are in competition for some magical scepter. Where this game is somewhat unique from the rest is that the racers are on foot, which doesn't sound incredibly exciting on paper, but in practice it was more enjoyable than I thought it would be. The tracks are quite creative in design and offer some good variety, and to be honest they're more like assault course tracks than they are race tracks. You will run, jump, glide, swim, climb and slide your way to the finish line, and along the way you'll pick up power-ups to take out those in front or shield yourself from those behind. The game is clearly crafted for a young audience, but working my way through the tracks was interesting because I never knew what obstacle was around the corner. A good racing game is one that makes you feel like you can always get back in the race no matter how many times you fall behind, and Mad Dash Racing certainly ticks that box. It also runs well and looks nice, and even though I don't really intend on playing it again anytime soon, I can't say that I have any serious complaints at the same time. The biggest compliment I can give here is that I wish I discovered this game when I was 12. 
Project Gotham Racing is a game that I never played until making this video, however Project Gotham Racing 2 is a game that I put a ridiculous amount of hours into, as it was one of the more popular games in the very early days of Xbox Live. So what does Project Gotham Racing play like? Well, it plays like Project Gotham Racing 2, except it has less tracks and less cars. If you've never played a game from this series, the best way to describe them, in my opinion, would be to say it's like Gran Turismo, but if it didn't take itself so seriously. The realistic cars are there, the realistic locations are also there too, but the key difference is that Project Gotham Racing has a splash of arcade mixed in and focuses a bit more on style. The cars don't handle like Burnout or Ridge Racer, you do have to be careful with your approach to corners and adjust your driving depending on what car you're in, but you'll also gain kudos points for overtaking and drifting. I feel like this simulation style, but slightly more light-hearted, really works in the game's favour. Of course, this is my personal preference, but even though Project Gotham Racing is still a challenge, it is also very approachable and fun to play. Plus, the cars do look really good for 2001, and overall it is held up really well visually. Now, here is a game that caught me by surprise big time. When I look at rally games, I just assume that they're solely made for rally fans, meaning they are as realistic as possible and require such precise control of the cars that you have to be a fan to persevere. I'm happy to report that I was wrong. Well, in some ways at least. I'm not saying that Rally Sport Challenge doesn't attempt to go for realism at all, but I am saying that the game is nowhere near as punishing as I thought it would be, and is a hell of a lot more fun than I was expecting. There is something about the driving in this game that keeps your hands really active throughout the entirety of its races, it's a lot of tapping of the acceleration and brake, and small nudges of the analog stick, and this results in races that are really engaging up until the finish line. It also provides you with a good selection of cars, a few different modes and environments to try so it doesn't seem to be lacking in terms of content either, and I think it's a very good sign that after I'm done with this video, I'm genuinely considering playing it again. Overall, it feels like a solid racer. My experience with games like this is limited, so for all I know this could be one of the crappier ones, but from my novice perspective, it's a fun time in some great looking cars that control well, and I'm not sure what more I could ask for. 4x4 EVO 2 was quite an interesting game to play straight after Rally Sport Challenges. I had the opposite expectations and reaction to it. Now, I suppose that sounds like I'm saying I expected to love it but hated it, but that's not the case. What I'm trying to say is that I assumed this game would be a bit more out there than it actually is. By no means is this game a hardcore simulation, but I did come away from it thinking it was kind of bland. Don't get me wrong, it controls perfectly well, the cars look decent, the tracks look acceptable, but overall I don't feel like it pulled me in as much as the other racers here. Once again we have another racer that offers plenty of content, in fact in terms of cars and tracks it might be the most stacked of the bunch, but that doesn't mean much if the moment to moment gameplay struggles to hold your interest. I will give the game credit though, one thing the developers did here which I've never seen in a racing game before is that the AI is almost programmed to play dirty. They'll nudge you off the road and even cut corners on a fairly regular basis, which is more funny than it is frustrating, so at least it has that as a bonus. Cell Damage is a game that I went back and forth on which category to place it in. It's kind of a combat slash racing game, but it's still mainly focused on be the first to do this or be the first to do that. As you can already see, it is incredibly cartoonish with its cell shaded art style and almost Looney Tune like characters in a bunch of wacky looking cars, and it leans very much towards being silly and simple to play, but that doesn't necessarily reduce the fun. In Cell Damage you'll race around the arena trying to score hits on other players or be the first to hit a number of checkpoints, and while doing so you'll pick up weapons like giant axes, miniguns, grenade launchers and harpoons. The weapons are fun to use initially, watching everybody blow up is great for a little while, but the repetitiveness sinks in quickly. This is one of those games that has more to offer if you play it with friends, as when you're playing it on your own you may grow tired of dominating the AI opponents. Now I know a lot of launch titles can end up being very simple, but sadly this game was a little too simple for me. This game was a little depressing for me to play, because after 5 minutes of playing Arctic Thunder, I immediately thought, 
Oh yeah, remember how much fun Midway used to bring to the video game industry? This is one of the most ridiculous things I have ever played in recent times, and when I say that, I mean it in the best way possible. I almost feel like I could just show footage of this game, not say a word, and it would get across just how fun it is. Arctic Thunder isn't perfect, of course, none of Midway's games ever were, but even though their games weren't of the highest quality, they always made fun a priority. Racing around in a snowmobile on some of the craziest tracks you'll come across, picking up all of the explosive and over-the-top boosts and abilities is exactly the kind of fast-paced fun you want in a game like this. I even appreciate the structure of the races as they're built in a way that never lets you fall too far behind, and while it hasn't aged that well visually, it is really hard to care when playing a game like this that is just arcade fun to the max. Reckless the Yakuza Missions is a bit of a strange game in which you play as one of two pairs of cops that hunt down members of the Yakuza by slamming your car into their cars and that's it, that's that's the game. That may sound very reductive, like I'm knocking the game for its simplicity, which I'm not, but I will knock the game for how it controls. These cars did not feel good to drive at all in my opinion, maybe if I spent some real time with it I'd adjust, but it was a real struggle to get around in this game, which made it twice as frustrating in some ways because the game is about speeding through a very traffic heavy Japan against a time limit. The positive is that when you do manage to smash your vehicle into an enemy, the destruction and the crashes are are pretty darn good. There are plenty of breakable objects in the environment and sprinkles of civilians running out of the way of cars which adds to the chaos in a good way. I also found the graphics on this one to be very up and down. Everything up close looks good, the vehicles in particular look great and things fall apart in a nice way. On the other hand, character models could look a lot better and the draw distance can really show the game's limitations. As I said, it's a bit of a strange game. There are moments of fun, moments of frustration, but I would be interested to see how this game performed on the less powerful consoles that it was later released on. Only one fighting game was available for the launch of the original Xbox, and boy did they get a good one. Now, in my last video where I covered the launch of the PS2, one of the fighting games included in that lineup was Dead or Alive 2, and I praised it as possibly one of my favourite fighters of all time. So you can probably imagine my thoughts on this game. In many ways, it is very much the same experience, incredibly snappy and fast-paced combat with powerful attacks and a great counter system. All of the fun and borderline stupid characters return, and there are a few new ones with their own unique fighting styles thrown in. At the same time, the game has also had a noticeable upgrade to its visuals, so the fact that it retains all of the fun of the last game is pretty darn impressive. Dead or Alive 3 is a great example of making small iterations to an already great thing. It is still a very accessible fighter with plenty of cool moves to pull off, no matter your level of skill, and knocking your opponent off of or through stuff is still fantastic. First up in the sports genre is Amped, a game I was really looking forward to playing as my only experience with the franchise was Amped 3, which was wacky beyond belief, so I was a little disappointed to discover that the wackiness didn't come in until later. The original Amped is much more of what you'd expect from an extreme sports game in 2001. It's a trick-focused snowboarding game with a soundtrack that sounds like it's ripped straight from Kerrang. For the most part, it is a fun time, although the controls are a tad too stiff for my life Liking, and the physics can be weird as I lost count of the amount of times I fell off my board unexpectedly. It has an interesting system of racing down the same mountain but from multiple angles, but apart from that it feels like it's lacking the right amount of flavour to make it stand out from the pack. When it gets going and you're on a roll it's a really good time, however when you begin to stumble and you're literally on a roll you might as well just hit restart because you've lost all momentum. Amped is a solid effort at providing an extreme sports experience and a solid platform for what would become a decent series, but I'm not raving about this first entry. 
Now, Dark Summit is a game that I already own, have played and reviewed for this channel. It wasn't good, I gave it two stars out of five, and I never played it again. Sadly, the copy of Dark Summit I own was for the PS2, and you have no idea how sad it is when you have to buy a bad game for the second time on a different console because you want your video to be authentic. There are no differences between the two versions, this is still a weird snowboarding game with a bunch of lame attitude to make it seem a bit more edgy, and the biggest struggle for me here is that I simply do not like how this game controls. It does have a decent approach to its missions, it's not really focused on racing or trick scores, instead it has a structure in which challenges are placed along the slopes that you're racing down, such as grab this item, outrun this guard, or perform this specific set of tricks. While it is a unique structure, some of the challenges are unfair and unbalanced, leaving you very little chance to complete them, and every time you fail, you'll want to throw the disc away. What also doesn't help is that the design of this game is clearly going for dark and dangerous, but it just just results in tracks that look kind of ugly in my opinion. Anyway, I own this game twice now, I'm not happy about it, so let's move on. I was very curious to play Transworld Surf as I just wasn't sure how you make a game out of this kind of sport. Now, I've not played a lot of surfing games, I'm not sure which surfing games are considered the good ones, but I will say that of the surfing games I have played, Transworld Surf was at least fun enough to hold my interest. I should say that I'm not good at this game at all, I lost count of the amount of times that I wiped out, but for some reason I wasn't discouraged from jumping back on the surfboard. On occasion I managed to pull off a few cool tricks and ride the wave for more than 30 seconds without almost drowning, and when I managed to keep my balance, I did have fun. There isn't much else I can say about this title. It really is a straightforward game. Aim for the highest score possible, try not to wipe out, and also try not to get eaten by sharks. Yes, you heard me correctly, that is a thing that can happen in this game. Also, the water does look really nice here, so the water tech is definitely where the developer threw all of their money. Dave Mira Freestyle BMX2 is a game with an overly long title, but it is also basically a Tony Hawk game but on a BMX, so I'm up for it. It's a lot of open environments with a list of tasks and challenges that you complete against a timer before you can move on. Are the controls a bit flimsy at times? Yes. Did I fall off my bike a billion times? Also yes, but did I have a good time? Absolutely. I feel like if I got stuck into this game properly and got my head around how everything works from a trick perspective, I'd have an even better time with it. Now, it is a bit meh visually, and overall the presentation is quite basic, but it's not so bad that it lessens the experience. The tracks you ride around in almost look like they could have been ripped directly from the Tony Hawk series, and they feature a good mixture of good man-made bike park environments, and also open world quirks too. To put it simply, Dave Mirror 2 knows what it's going for and sticks to it. By no means is it perfect, but it still has something to offer. Hey, remember when Tony Hawk games were good? Well, I do, and they don't get much better than Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. This game is everything you remember the series to be, lots of cool creative levels filled with weird and funny challenges for you to chip away at, and all round it's just a blast to play. At this point the series was in a nice sweet spot. We were a few games in, so the controls had been tightened up and refined, the developers had fully settled into their unique take on skateboarding, but at the same time the series was also still new enough that it hadn't got old yet. The soundtrack the track is fantastic and makes you feel like you're back in the 2000s again. Obviously time hasn't been kind to the graphics, but the important thing here is that it works and it fits perfectly into the category of games that are easy to learn but hard to master. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 is a game that is hard not to love, and my heart aches when I think about just how far this series has fallen off, so before I start tearing up, we'll move on to the next game. Okay, so I don't know exactly who was in charge of the NHL franchise at EA during this period, but whoever they were, they clearly knew what they were doing when it comes to making a fun sports title. In my video where I covered the launch of the PS2, I played NHL 2001 and had a surprisingly good time. 
This time I took a run at NHL 2002, and the game is just as fun, if not better. And let me state that I don't know anything about hockey, I've never watched a single match, but even as someone who barely understands the rules, I really enjoyed my time with this game. It is fast paced, fairly straightforward and brutal. A good example of this is the incredibly over the top action replays it uses when you drive straight through someone with a tackle. The presentation is still top notch, as I found it to be in the previous version, and whether up close or far away, the game does look great for its time. Maybe this isn't even that great of a game, and instead I've just not realised yet that I'm actually a fan of the sport, but at the very least I can say that I very quickly got to grips with the game's controls and felt comfortable taking people on, and that's exactly what you want from a sports game. So remember earlier in this video how I spoke about just how much fun Midway brought to the industry? Well, as it turns out, NHL Hits 2002 is another example of that. Where NHL 2002 by EA leans more towards simulation of the sport, NHL Hits 2002 seems to throw that out of the window in service of a more arcade style of sports game. For the most part, it actually plays very much like EA Sports Counterpart, so a lot of the stuff I said about that game holds true here. It is fun to play, easy to get into, and this game looks slightly worse but still pretty good for its time. Where this game differs is that it moves at a faster pace and comes with much harder hits. And when I say harder hits, I mean so hard that other players' helmets fall off when you tackle them. It also has mini games in which you can get into scraps with the opposing team members, and I think that alone tells you the vibe of this sports title. This is Midway doing its Midway thing again, so depending on which style of sports game you prefer, at least you had options, but for me, I'm arcade all the way, and this game delivers it in abundance. Unlike the NHL, I am at least somewhat familiar with the NBA, as I used to have a minor interest in the sport during the same period of this console generation, so while I'm not an expert, I feel like I can at least give a half-decent opinion on NBA Live 2002. The common thing with EA Sports games of this era, whether you're talking about Madden, FIFA or NBA Live, is that when returning to them so many years later, you notice just how big of a role physics now play in modern games, and by comparison, these older games come across as overly simplistic. In some ways this can make games easier to get into if you are new to the sport. Take my comments on the NHL games as an example of this, but if you're an experienced player who's kept up with current games, then the back and forth on the court becomes less engaging to play. I'm not saying that NBA Live 2002 is bad. Far from it. It plays like a basketball game, it looks like a basketball game, and Shaq sort of looks like Shaq. But I think what I'm trying to say here is that sports titles are the biggest losers over time because of how iterative they are. So if they don't have a unique style or feature to hook you in, then your time with it will be a bit of a shoulder shrug. So while it's a solid game to have at launch, it's not something I'd recommend you rushing out to add to your collection. Fusion Frenzy is exactly the sort of game that you should release at the launch of a console. Every console needs a party game, and the original Xbox only had one, and even though it's not a game of the highest quality, I think it does exactly what it was designed to do, which is provide an opportunity for everybody to crowd round a new system and have a good time. We've all played a game like this at one point or another, so most of you know the deal. You and your friends select one of many colourful characters, and then you hit start and work your way through a dozen or so of wacky minigames as you compete with each other for the top spot. Fusion Frenzy is no better or worse than any other game like this that you might have played. The objectives from round to round are based around surviving, racing or scoring the most points, the controls are always simple so that anyone can join in, and you'll probably see everything that you need to see in a matter of hours. With a group of friends to compete against, I imagine this is a much more fun time, however when I was playing it by myself for this video, it was slightly depressing. The game is perfectly fine, I just felt very lonely in that moment. Starting off the action genre we have Deadly Skies, also known as Air Force Delta Storm in some regions. I loaded up this title expecting it to be a lot more cheesy than it actually was, so I'm not sure if I set myself up for a fall there, but either way I can still see the appeal of this game. I quite like the approach to its campaign in which it presents you with a map that you can move across one step at a time, planning your route to your next mission while getting into dogfights along the way, but because you have to return to your base to stock up and repair, there is a risk versus reward element to the game. The moment to moment gameplay is where I occasionally stumbled. It controls well enough, 
but I felt like once I got the hang of how it played, my brain was switching off from time to time as the missions didn't really challenge me. Visually, it's more bland than I would have liked, which is a shame because I didn't feel like anything in the game looked bad, there just wasn't a ton of stuff to look at. I understand it can be hard to make a game look appealing when 80% of the time you're looking at the sky, but even when you lower your altitude to take on tanks and boats, it still had less flavour than I thought it would have. Obviously, for all I know, at the tail end of this game, things could get much more crazy, but I can't say that I was drawn in by its design. Design. Oddly enough, I have added the game to my backlog to find out if it gets better as it goes on, but that backlog is large and Deadly Skies is almost at the bottom of that pile. I've seen a few copies of Blood Wake over the years and never bothered to pick it up because from the look of the cover art, I assumed it was some post-apocalyptic racing game in speedboats. Then when I came to make this video, I found that I was totally wrong, not about the speedboats, but about it being a racing game. Turns out that Blood Wake is actually an action title in which you work your way through a number of missions, speeding across the water in some far east location as you take out bad guys with the variety of weapons strapped to your boat. The tricky thing with games based on water is that it is hard to make them feel realistic without also making them feel a bit awkward. I don't think it helps that Blood Wake assigns all of its movement to the left and analog stick, so no acceleration or brakes on the triggers. In some ways I was pleasantly surprised to find out that this game wasn't what I thought it was, but at the same time what I did end up playing was kind of boring. There is some auto aim to help with the wobbly movement of the boat, but the combat still falls kind of flat. I'm not sure if it's because the explosions lacked impact, but the shootouts feel monotonous. Finally, Blood Wake goes for a unique style of having hand-drawn images for cutscenes, but it just comes across as a game on a tight budget. Look, someone clearly had an idea here, and they went for it. I'm not sure if time or money constraints restricted this game's potential, but it just doesn't hit the mark that it's going for, sadly. I've got to say, it was a little weird to play this one, as my brain completely forgot that there were Batman games before the Arkham series, and then I very quickly remembered how 99% of games based on superheroes were always just kind of okay. Batman Vengeance is no different. It is a game in which you progress through linear missions that take place in the dark and gritty city of Gotham. You'll take part in a bit of platforming, bits and pieces of stealth, and you'll punch a lot of criminals in the face. All of these activities are aided by Bruce Wayne's arsenal of gadgets, of course. The highlight of this game for me is that it is a good representation of the animated series that we all know and love, and it is interesting to play a game based in that world. As for the rest of the game, it's fairly standard stuff. Nothing about the gameplay really stands out. It's a very run-of-the-mill brawler for the most part. For me personally, I'm a big enough fan of the character to overlook some of its minor issues, like its camera and stiff movement that left me feeling vulnerable jumping from one place to another. But if that's not the case for you, what you have here is the definition of a 3 out of 5 experience in my opinion. It's entertaining to exist in this world, but take that away and what you're left with is a game that is fine, but all superhero games were like this back then, so it is expected. Okay, bit of a confession here, I have owned Jet Set Radio for 18 years, and the first time that I played this game was for making this video, and boy oh boy do I feel like an idiot. If you're unaware of Jet Set Radio Future, it is a sequel to the Dreamcast exclusive Jet Set Radio, a series all about exploring the city on rollerblades and tagging every wall in graffiti. I've not played the original, so I can't tell you how much of a step up this game is, but I can tell you that it's a really fun game in its own right. The gameplay here is simple, it makes it very easy for you to look stylish, and in some cases it feels like you are magnetised to the rails that you want to grind on, and tagging walls is just as easy as pressing a button when you run past them. Even though the game is simple, it more than makes up for it because it's full of colour, full of personality, awesome design work, a funky soundtrack and quirky characters. I don't even know what's going on in this weird world, but I do know that I enjoy being part of it. There's a flow to everything in Jet Set Radio Future that somehow felt both exciting and relaxing at the same time, and the hours I spent with it just seemed to fly by because everything felt so breezy and it was just so easy to keep playing. All in all, I am very disappointed in myself for not playing this game for nearly two decades, but this is something I have now corrected and intend to return to the game soon. The worst part about making this video was the moment I learned that Shrek was a launch title and that I was now obligated 
as a fully grown man in 2020 to search for and purchase this game. It cost me £5 in total, and honestly that was £5.50 too much. Movie-based games were always subpar, so I already went in with somewhat low expectations, but after 5 minutes of playing the game when I was in the middle of a tutorial that was teaching me how to use my farts and burps as attacks, I knew it was downhill from there. I'm pretty sure that even by just watching this video and seeing how Shrek runs, even you can tell the level of quality we're dealing with here. I avoided games like these like the plague back then, and Shrek has helped me further justify that decision. Everything is focused around Shrek completing good deeds for people, which results in a long list of boring and occasionally annoying tasks, like rounding up Little Bo Peep's sheep while fighting off the big bad wolf. To be fair to the game, all of the tasks are short and easy, so you won't have to suffer for too long, but there's not a lot to like here. I don't think it looks too bad, I've definitely seen worse, but it's not inspiring. Instead, it comes across as exactly what it is, and exactly what most movie tie-ins were, which is an overly simple and unpolished game that was put together because they knew the movie was going to be a hit. The penultimate game in the action genre is Oddworld Munch's Odyssey. What I should state right off the top is that I am not a fan of the Oddworld franchise in the slightest. I tried many times to play the games that were released on the PS1 and had no joy whatsoever. The interesting thing about Munch's Odyssey is that I actually enjoyed playing it. The setup is that you switch back and forth between Abe and Munch as you work through different areas, liberating your people, growing your following and fighting back against the evil corporation. This is the first game in the series where it transitioned to 3D movement, which is probably why why I liked it a bit more, but the game is simply an action platformer where you use your growing following to help you solve puzzles, open doors and fight off bad guys. Now, there are a few quality of life improvements I would have made if I could, but overall my list of complaints isn't large, and this game grew on me in a very short space of time. I should say that I'm not a fan of its design, something about the overall aesthetic just doesn't do it for me, but it didn't drag things down too much because the cutscenes are well directed and animated. So yeah, surprise hit for me here, and I recommend you give it a try. Rounding off the action genre is Max Payne, a game that I'm a big fan of, and when I reviewed it for my channel, I gave it 5 stars out of 5. That review was just under a year ago, and in that time, nothing has changed. This is still an awesome third-person shooter with groundbreaking bullet time mechanics that oozes with film noir and comic book style. There are so many things to enjoy about Max Payne, its world is gritty and on occasion horrific, and the game is just as fun to work through as the story is intriguing. Even this many years Years later, diving around in slow motion with two pistols is incredibly entertaining, and the whole experience has this tongue-in-cheek tone that its developers, and especially its voice actors, lean into, making it all the more enjoyable. The action is non-stop, and the game is all the better for it. There are a few moments of frustrating platforming, but not enough to ruin things, and really it's exactly the kind of thing you want from a retro game, something that has a good pace to it and can also be completed in a weekend. Sure, the faces look a little weird, but as a whole, I actually think Max Payne still looks nice. Well, not nice, the world looks like an awful place to live, but it looks awful in a good way if that makes any sense. I'm not here to bore you to death about how much I love Max Payne, because I have a dedicated video review for that. What I am here to tell you is that it's definitely one of the best from the launch lineup, the passing of time hasn't made it any worse, and you should pick it up and play it if you can. Okay, here it is, the final game, the only first person shooter at launch, and arguably the game that made this console relevant, Halo Combat Evolved. If you're a subscriber to my channel or you follow me on Twitter, then you know that I am a huge fan of this series, and Halo Combat Evolved is a game that I could not stop playing when I first got my Xbox. I almost find it hard to be objective about this title. I mean, it's Halo. I don't even think I need to talk about whether this game holds up or if it's worth playing.
playing in 2020, or if you should add it to your collection, because to me, the answer is a strong yes to all of those. All you need to know is that this is a great first-person shooter with excellent gameplay that has aged well over the years. Its story is slightly cheesy sci-fi fun, with a lot of moments of spectacle. Its audio offers both great sound effects with powerful gunfire, and an epic sounding soundtrack that almost all of us have heard of this point, and all round, this game is fantastic. In my personal and very biased opinion, this is one of the best games ever made. Now, that may not be the case for everyone, of course, but the objective for this video was to find out how all of the launch games for this console hold up today. And for me, Halo Combat Evolved is number one in this category by a decent margin. And there you have it, those are my impressions of the 25 Xbox launch games that I could get my hands on. It is a bit of a strange launch lineup to be honest, because it's over a year after the launch of its biggest competitor, the PS2, so a lot of games on here are also available on another system, so unlike other console launches, the number of exclusives is a lot less. The overall impression of this selection of launch games for me is that Microsoft didn't take any huge risks with games that attempted to do something crazy with the unique tech available to them. A lot of games on this list feel like safe picks, like they had boxes to tick on what they thought a launch lineup should look like. While a lot of the picks are safe, unlike other launch lineups that I've seen or been around for, I can at least say that for the original Xbox, you could have picked up this console on day one and walked away with five or six games that weren't just good for day one, but genuinely quality games that have stood the test of time. Max Payne is an unbelievably good third person shooter that introduced the gaming world to bullet time, Jet Set Radio Future is one of the most stylish games I've ever played, and as for Halo, well for me it's one of the best shooters ever, but we all know what that game would go on to become. Sure, there are some games in there that you should probably avoid, like Dark Summit, 4x4 Evo 2, and definitely Shrek, but every launch comes with a bit of filler. I do have to give some praise to some of the games that try to go for something different. For example, Mad Dash Racing is a fresh approach to the racing genre, it just needed more polish, and Blood Wake is a neat idea that just didn't pan out unfortunately, but at least they tried. Ultimately, the thing that makes this console special to me is that in 2002, buying this thing felt like a bit of a gamble, but it's a gamble that for me paid off in a way that I couldn't expect. Some of my best memories were on games that were exclusive to this system, and these are experiences I would not have had if I didn't take a chance on this console all those years ago. And I'm still a fan of Xbox today, with an Xbox Live account that will soon be 17 years old. The original Xbox is not a perfect system, and all of the games aren't 5 out of 5, but I was there from the start, and from these 25 games, I got to see it grow into something great, and the console still sits proudly on my shelf till this day.